this new set of questions is all about forces. Now, I'm going to preface this by saying if you've taken any physics before, and even culturally, you may have seen before the equation F equals MA, although sadly it probably left the vectors off when you've seen it before. And that's one of the most important equations in physics. It's probably going to be the most important equation in the class this semester. It doesn't encapsulate everything we're doing. But I'm not going to talk about that yet, because I want to start by thinking just about the forces. And one of the things about thinking about, well, so here's two things when thinking about forces. One, identify the interaction that is giving rise to the force. So the force is a, ultimately, it's a thing that we model in physics to say, how does the interaction affect different things? Well, we, it turns out that you can boil a lot of interactions down to, ooh, this object is exerting a force on that object. But when you identify the interaction, you can identify what two objects are interacting and what is the nature of that interaction. You should be able to do that with every force that you draw. Second, free body diagrams. Oh my goodness, they're important. And students sometimes don't do it. They try to jump straight to the equations, and you're going to do it wrong if you do that. So I'm really emphasizing free body diagrams. So here's the first question. A ladder is leaning at an angle against a wall. Actually, before I go on, I'm just going to draw that. So here's a wall. Here is the ground, which it didn't say was there, but we can accept that it's there because when a ladder leans against the, a wall, it's on the ground. And here is the ladder. Woo, that wasn't very hard. Okay, I have a ladder leaning at an angle against a wall. Good enough. You know what? I'm going to make the ladder a little bit bigger. Oh, yes, I feel so much better now. Okay. Both the wall and the ground are possibly rough. Mm, what could he be talking about? Could he possibly suggest in did I do the sentence right? I can't even talk. Could he possibly be suggesting that there might be friction? That's what I'm trying to say. Draw a free body diagram for the ladder, indicating all forces that are acting on it. Okay, so first of all, free body diagram. The word free in free body diagram is not just jargon. What it means is you draw the body by itself, so it's free. Now, there's, so I'm going to draw this picture twice. So it's just the ladder. What are the forces acting on the ladder? Well, let's start with the one that always happens whenever you do stuff near the surface of the Earth. There is gravity. Gravity acts at the center of mass. Sort of not really. I mean, really, it's acting everywhere there's mass. But if you have an extended object, an extended rigid object in particular, which a ladder is, gravity behaves as if it were acting at the center of mass. And so there it is. Gravity is acting at the center of mass. Um, so I draw a little point at the center of mass. There is gravity. Yay! All right, what else do we have? Well, we've got a contact here between the ladder and the ground. Right, so, so we should expect contact interactions. We also have contact between the ladder and the wall. So we should expect contact interactions there. Do we have anything else? It's not moving, so there's not going to be any air resistance. Um, and air resistance would be pathetic in this case anyway, so we would just ignore it. Um, uh, it's not electrically charged and there's no electric fields. You know, Darth Vader isn't over here with the force, so we don't have to worry about that one. Um, so these are the only other ones we have are the contact, and then with the contact, there's actually two different contact interactions we could have. First of all, it's resting on the ground. This point on the ladder is resting against the ground. There will be a normal force of the ground pushing back up on the ladder. I'm going to label that F sub N G for the normal force of the ground. Also, it's resting against the wall. And so, since the wall is vertical, the normal force points perpendicular to the plane of contact. Now you say, wait, there's no plane of contact since it's a little corner of the ladder. Well, if you look at the ladder, there might actually be a little flat feet. Some ladder actually have flat feet for good reasons. But in any event, even if it's just a little corner, there's going to be some little flat little thing. In any event, the wall, it's very clear which direction that is. So perpendicular to the wall is the normal force, so there'll be a normal force of the wall that way. And then finally, friction. I said they're rough. Which way is friction going to be? Well, it turns out that I could just guess. I'm going to start this by drawing it in light blue because I'm going to erase this in a moment. I could just guess which way friction is. Let's just say, and you're going to say, wait, that's dumb. I know it's not that way, and that's the whole point. Let's say that the wall friction force is that way. And then I go and I calculate out all of the stuff that I need to calculate. And when all is said and done, I discover that I have, so what I would do is I would put in the wall friction force as if it were pointing this way. In fact, I don't really need it for this problem. We're going to draw in some axes. 
So I would say, oh, the wall friction force is acting in the negative y direction. Good. I'm just going to put it in, knowing it's in the negative y direction. If I get a negative magnitude for the wall friction force, you know forces can't have negative magnitudes. If I calculated it out and got a negative magnitude, that tells me, oh, I drew the wall friction force the wrong way. There's other ways you can handle this by always insisting on making, so, all right, so I have the y component of wall friction is going to be um, FWFY, and not even worry about which direction it is, but for these forces often it's easier to, to sort of know which direction you start with. So I could put it in that way. If I calculate it out, it's the other way around, because I get a negative magnitude, then I'll know, oh, I drew it wrong. But in this case, we actually can use our intuition to figure out which way to draw it. Now let's just think about this. If you have a ladder against a wall, and let's imagine the wall and the ground is slick, what's going to happen? It's going to slide like that. So if it's sliding like that, what's resisting the sliding? Well, there's going to be the force of friction. This I'll say F sub FW, friction on the wall. What a terrible F. One of these days I'm going to learn how to write letters. So here's the force of the friction with the wall. And then here is the force of friction with the ground. And now I have all the forces. So there's potentially five different forces acting on this. One of the things you will discover when we go on and we solve the statics problem in a week or two is that um, even when we know everything, it's going to be impossible to figure out all these forces separately. So usually what I end up doing to make the problem doable is I say, oh, the wall is very slick. It's covered with oil or something like that so that this friction force goes away and then you can calculate everything. But don't worry about that for now. All we're worried about right now is being able to, to figure out what interactions there are and draw the forces. And of course, the first one we started with, the force of gravity, what is that interaction with? It's with the Earth. The Earth is pulling down on the ladder. And of course, by Newton's third law, that means the ladder is pulling up on the Earth. You could also forget there's an Earth there and just say, oh, we're in a uniform gravitational field. Good approximation when you're near the surface of the Earth. And then it's, this is the interaction with the gravitational field. But that's a little more abstract. And in this case, it's correct to say the interaction is with the Earth. So you might as well stick with that. All right, so that's the first problem. Here's our free body force diagram for our ladder. OK, second problem. A child is pulling a wagon by its handle. So I'm going to go ahead and draw the situation here. So here's the wagon. Here's the handle. Here's the child. There's the child's hand. Here's the child's other hand. And the child is happy. OK, good. Child is pulling a wagon by its handle. I guess I'll draw it in the ground, too, because that's the implication, is that it's, I mean, I suppose this child could be in deep space pulling a wagon around, but most of the children you know or have been pulling wagons, or does anyone pull wagons anymore? When I was a kid, I had a little red wagon that we would pull around, and that's an iconic child's toy, but I wonder if they even do that anymore, or if it's all like, you know, here's what, what do children look like nowadays, or here's my iPhone, and that's what children are like from age three. I'll draw my pen. Okay. Good, that was so irrelevant. Next, um, draw a free body diagram for the wagon and for the child. Identify, including all relevant forces, and identify any third law pairs. Now, free body diagram. Free, you draw them by themselves. So I'm gonna start, and I'm gonna draw it bigger, because I can, with the wagon. All right, there is the wagon. What forces are acting on the wagon? We're on Earth, there's gravity. Here's the center of mass of the wagon. There's a gravitational force that way. Next, it's sitting on the ground. There's a normal force. Now, this is one of those cases where it's not obvious where to draw the normal force. Because, well, it's going to be where it contacts with the ground, right? That's where the ground's pushing back up on it. And there's two points, really four, if you think in 3D. Ooh, now I'm going to try and draw it in 3D. This is a mistake. I just want you to know I know this ahead of time. So here's the wagon. And here's those wheels. And here's another wheel, and there's another wheel back there. All right, that, like I said, it was a mistake to try and draw the video. Whatever, there's four wheels on the wagon. So do I draw two normal forces? Maybe. For our current purposes, we don't care exactly where it is. In fact, if you think about a box sitting on the ground, we usually draw, I'm off topic a little bit, but not really. We, we, we would draw gravity that way, and we would draw the normal force here. And of course, I have violated my rules. It's not a free body diagram because I have the ground there. We'll cope. We'll survive. We draw the normal force at the center of the box because that's where it acts. Where does it really act? Well, if it's a uniform box, everywhere along the bottom it's pushing up. And so what the normal force is is sort of the average of where it acts. And if we're trying to think about how does the box get pushed around, 
treating it as being at the average is exactly right. It's just like gravity. Um, really, if you're extended, I mean, hold your arms out. You feel gravity wants to pull your arm down. You get tired after a while holding your arms out. Obviously, gravity is acting everywhere you have mass, but then we go and draw it just at the center of mass. So we're making an approximation, a very good approximation, but when we get into torques, it'll start to matter a little bit more by saying the normal force acts at the center. So if you're uncomfortable, there's two ways you could do this. You could just draw the normal forces acting right here, whoop, whoop, and say that's the normal force. You could go ahead and divide up the normal force, but then say, oh, because of all the symmetry, which actually turns out may not be true when we get to torques, we'll worry about this more, that it's the same on the front and back wheels. Or you could just draw it at one of the wheels, and that's what I'm going to do right now with the understanding that I am being a little sloppy here by drawing the normal force just on one of the wheels. But what I'm saying is that this is the normal force from all of the wheels together. I'm drawing at one of the wheels so I don't have to keep track of it. Later it will matter which wheel it's on. Um, here's one of the things, uh, we'll talk about this when we get later, like when you're riding a bicycle and you use your brakes, the brake on the front wheel matters more than the brake on the back wheel when you're really trying to stop. But we'll get to all that a little later. Okay, good. That's the normal force. See, you never thought the normal force was so hard. And it's not the normal force, it's a normal force. It's the normal force of the interaction of the ground pushing back up on the wagon. Finally, we have, and here's what, this is really sort of a tension force because it's pulling but I'm going to just abstract it here as, I'm going to call it F pull, it's the child pulling on the wagon right there. Okay, good. Now let's draw the child. So, if we draw the child, let's draw the child in green. Separate free body diagram. Um, we have the same forces. First of all, gravity acts at the center of mass. There's a normal force of the ground the same thing applies, right? The normal force is really on both feet. I'm gonna just draw it on one of the feet. I will also use my intuition here and say it should have been the same length as gravity because otherwise the kid would be falling in, but let's not worry about it. What's more, I don't wanna draw it on that foot. I wanna draw it on this foot just to save room over here because there is an F wagon. Go ahead and pull on a wagon and you feel it pushing into your hand, right? the handle of your wagon, that means the wagon's exerting a force on you. Ultimately, with a handle, it's the, here's the rod of the handle, here's you pulling on it, it's sort of a compression interaction between this rod and your hand. We'll abstract all of that and just say, look, the, the wagon, you're connected to it, it's pulling back on your hand there, there's a wagon force right there. And if they're walking, there might be air resistance, that's gonna be really tiny unless the wind is huge for a child pulling a wagon. So, we're done. We've drawn all the forces. One thing left to do, identify third law pairs. Many of you will be tempted to say, oh, it's these two because they balance. No, not every time two forces balance is it a third law pair. Remember what the third law says, and by third law we mean Newton's third law, is that if two objects are interacting, the force of object A on object B is equal in magnitude and opposite in direction to the force of object B on object A. Well, we have two objects we've drawn, this and this. Now, for every force, there's something else it's interacting with. Normal force, the ground. Gravity force, the earth. But we only have only one force between two objects here, and that's these two. So these are third law pairs. And therefore, we know that F pull is equal to minus F wagon, right? Same magnitude, but opposite directions. Well, what happens when you multiply a vector by negative one? You get another vector with the same magnitude pointing in the opposite direction. So that's the only third law pair we have in this problem. That is the second problem. Are you ready for this? Here it comes. This is like one of those moments when you're taking a Shakespeare class and you finally get to to be or not to be. Or you're reading, you're taking an Italian Renaissance literature class and Dante finally gets led to hell by Virgil. Uh, or you're taking a World War II class and Hitler invades Poland. Right? This is the moment, this is the key moment in the class when we finally reach the most important thing it's all about. A block is sliding down an inclined plane. Beautiful, isn't it? It's ridiculous. Um, here's the thing. 
physicists, why are physicists so freaking obsessed with blocks sliding down inclined planes? Well, okay, there's actually a good reason for it. Remember what I told you on the first day of class, that physics is all about coming up with sort of the simple models that capture the underlying behavior of, of natural systems, and in particular mechanical systems is what we're talking about here. Mechanical doesn't mean <laughs> mechanical means things in terms of um, the laws of mechanics. So gravity and Newton's laws and stuff like that. And this is a simple mechanical system that we're capable of talking about fully, but that has just enough complication in it, enough complexity into it, that we can actually unpack some of the simple behavior and, and get some insights about physics. So the block sliding down the inclined plane, there's nothing particularly important about, about a block sliding down an inclined plane, but it is a nice example that then is an approximation of like your desk is at an angle and your books are sliding off of it or whatever. Right, so again, it's not that this is important, it's that this gets at some of the underlying physics we care about. Um, one of the things where it says, the plane is inclined at an angle of 12 degrees relative to the horizontal. So I'm going to draw this angle, I'm going to call it theta, because remember, do not plug numbers in until you absolutely have to. Numbers like 12 degrees are complicated numbers. You don't want to deal with them, so I'm just going to say theta equals 12 degrees. And there it is, we've got it. Next. The block has a mass of 0.25 kilograms. I'm going to label this block with an M, but we know that the mass of the block, what did I say I already forgot? 0.25 kilograms. I'm just noting this for future reference. There is a normal force between the plane and the block of magnitudes 2.40 newtons. Well, all right. Now that I'm talking about normal forces and stuff like that, I'm starting to think maybe I should draw a free body diagram because my instincts and what I want your instincts to become, tell me that whenever you're dealing with a bunch of forces on an object, you probably want to draw a free body diagram because it'll make your life easier. So let's go ahead. We've got a gravity force that way. We have a normal force that way, right? The normal force is always perpendicular to the plane of interaction, which is clearly that. Um, and we'll get to the actual angle of it. And finally, the block is sliding down the plane, and I will mention friction in the upcoming uh, what's the word on the sentence? And so I'm going to go ahead and put in a frictional force here, and those are all the forces that are acting. It's possible that there's also air resistance as the bolt block slides. That won't matter unless the block gets moving pretty fast. Good, okay. There, the, there's a normal force between the plane and the block of magnitudes 2.40 newtons. So I can put in F sub n equals 2.40 newtons, and I want to point out my notation here. Fn vector is the normal force. Fn without the vector, the magnitude of the normal force is 2.40 newtons. So saying the normal force here between the block and the plane is 2.40 newtons is slightly misstating it. Actually, it's hugely misstating it because a force can't just have a magnitude. The magnitude of a force can just have a number. But if it's a force, it has to have a direction. So that's why I say the magnitude is that. And finally, there is a frictional force between the block and the plane of magnitude 0.35 newtons. So we know the magnitude of the frictional force is 0.35 newtons. To find the x-axis is horizontal and the y-axis is vertical. That's x, that's y. The block is sliding down towards positive x. Okay, I guess I really needed to know. In fact, on this picture I could draw, that's the way the block is sliding. We won't ever figure out v in this case, but I'll draw it there. That's the way it's sliding and it's sliding towards positive x. Right, why did I even say that? Why? Because I could have drawn the block like this with positive x that way, and that would have been backwards from what I intended, so I actually told you that here. The real question is, what is the net force on the block? That's really easy. The net force is equal to Fg plus Fn plus Ff. It is the vector sum of the three forces on the block. But when I say what is the net force, what I'm really looking for, I've got all numbers here. I should be able to give a number, in fact, not a number, I should be able to give three numbers for the three components. I should note also here that sticking out of the board is the z-axis. So I should be able to give you all three components of the force. Hey, the z component is zero. That was easy. The ones that are harder are the fact that this and this are not right all in x or y. So let's start with the easiest one. We're going to start, I don't like that pen. We're going to start with gravity because that's the easiest force because we know that gravity is zero, comma, comma minus mg, comma zero, 
because gravity always acts down, y is up, so therefore gravity is in the negative direction. And what's more, we have the number here. I'm going to go ahead and put it in so we have it. So gravity is 0, 0 0.25 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared, comma, 0. So we know that gravity is 0, comma. Now I have to do the calculation. OK, gravity is 0, comma, minus 2.45 newtons comma zero. Excellent. That is what gravity is. That's what the force of gravity is. So I have it either as a number or as uh, symbolically. I can use whichever one turns out to be convenient. Next, let's do friction next because that's a little bit easier in this case than, than the other one. And that's because we know the angle that friction is acting at. Right? Friction is acting that way. You can see that the force of friction has a positive y component and a negative x component. And you know that this is going to be 12 degrees because friction x parallel to the plane. So it's going to be the same thing. In fact, I'm just going to label this as theta here. So that tells us that the x component of friction is going to be FF times cosine, ah, I lied. It's going to be minus F sub F times cosine theta y because adjacent over hypotenuse is cosine, so this divided by this has to be cosine, and then we also know the x component is negative, so we'll put that in. And then f sub fy is equal to f sub f sine theta, because opposite over hypotenuse is sine, so you get the sine there. If I divide ff out, I get, hey, look. Excellent, so now I know what friction is, so then we just have to calculate what the numbers are. Um, so we have both, I'll write it up here. F sub F is equal to the magnitude of F sub F minus the magnitude of F sub F cosine theta, comma, F sub F sine theta, comma, zero. And we have it there symbolically. Let's also get the numbers in case we need those, because we know we will. So it's going to be minus 0 0.35 newtons times cosine 12 degrees. Um, and I'll do that in a moment, and I'll say that this is equal to 0 0.35 newtons times sine 12 degrees. Put those in my calculator here. Okay, having put these in my calculator, I get that this is equal to, I'm going to write it to extra digits here, minus 0 0.3424 newtons. And this is equal to minus 0 0.0728 newtons. Excellent. So I now I know the frictional force is minus 0 0.3424, I'm keeping extra digits deliberately here. Newton's comma, this is not a minus, that's a plus, right? The y component of friction is positive. 0 0.07, let's write it so I can read it again later. 0 0.728 Newton's comma zero. Now I know the frictional force. The one that's a little bit trickier, and that's just because of figuring out the angle, is the normal force in this case. So the normal force between the block and the plane. Well, all right, here's how to figure this out. What I'm going to do is I'm going to draw the normal force over here as well. And I'm going to draw this. This is the vertical. And the vertical is perpendicular to the horizontal. Okay. The normal force is perpendicular to the plane of the rise. So this is perpendicular to this. This is perpendicular to that. Now, I want you to imagine, take this angle right here and rotate it by 90 degrees. Well, if I rotate it by 90 degrees, this dashed line, the vertical, becomes the horizontal. And the normal force it becomes this plane here. So if I just take this angle and I rotate it by 90 degrees, I know this 90 degrees becomes that. That tells me this angle has to be theta. Also imagine if this, if the, if it went from 12 degrees, which I've actually drawn it bigger than 12 degrees, but imagine that it closed up. Also, the normal force would be getting more and more vertical. This one would be closing up too. This is how you do this kind of thing, is you identify. Okay, the angle between this and this, because this is the y-axis is vertical. Well, okay, that's a perpendicular angle. Here's a perpendicular angle. So now I can think about what happens if I rotate this angle 90 degrees. Oh, I get exactly this angle. That's how you figure out which one of these angles this is. So for the normal force, we have it's that way. You know what? I don't want to erase my free body diagram because it's because free body diagrams are holy. Okay. You notice it has both a positive x and a positive y component. Okay, This is the adjacent over the hypotenuse, so this is going to have 
or the y component of the normal force is fn cosine theta. This is the opposite over the hypotenuse, so this is fn sine theta. So if I divide this by the hypotenuse, I get just sine theta, as expected. So now I know the normal force. I need to, let's go ahead and put in the numbers also. And what did I say the normal force was? 2.40 newtons. So that's going to be 2.40 newtons times sine 12, is it 12 degrees? Yes, 12 degrees. And this is equal to 2.40 newtons times cosine 12 degrees. So I can calculate those numbers. Okay, and having calculated them, the uh, x component, which is actually, I've drawn this angle way bigger than 12, the x component should be pretty small because this is a little angle there. The x component is 0 0.49, how many digits did I keep over here? I went to the fourth digit, let's go. 0 0.4990, 4990 newtons, and the y component is 2.3476 newtons. So I can now write that up here. So the normal force is Fn sine theta in x. See, if you've memorized, oh, x is sine and y is cosine, you're going to get things backwards. You have to draw the picture every time and make sure you know. Fn cosine theta comma zero. And in terms of numbers, the x is 0 0.4990. The y is 2.3476 comma 0. I'm going to put the units outside. I'm not consistent, but whatever. I'll deal. In fact, I'm a terrible person because I left 3424. 3424. I left the newtons off of the x component of friction. But it's there now. I feel much happier. Excellent. Now I know everything. Now I'm going to erase my holy free body diagram. No, I'm not. I'm not going to erase the free body diagram. I can now calculate this. The net force is the vector sum, meaning I do not add 2.45, minus 2.45, 2 2.40, 0.35. I will never add those three numbers. The uh, three vectors are not in the same direction, so it does not make sense to add their magnitudes. That's just not even a meaningful thing. It's a vector sum, so I have to add the vectors, which means adding the components. So let's go ahead and add them. So in the x direction, I have a 0 from gravity. I have a minus 0.3424 from the friction. I have a 0 0.4990 from the normal force. So if I add those two together, right? so it's 0 0.4990 minus 0 0.3424. I'm going to have 0 0.1566. All right, so it's 0 0.1566 newtons. And then in the y direction, well, now we have three numbers, so I'm not going to try and do it in my head. We have a 2.45 negative because of gravity. We have a 0 0.0728 positive because of normal force between the plane and the box. And we have a, I don't believe that at all. Sorry, that's from friction. And yes, right, friction's acting a little bit in positive y. And then finally, we have a 2.3476, 2.3476. Uh, from the normal force, and I get minus 0 0.2, let's do it right, 0 0.296 newtons, comma 0. That is the net force. Or if we do it to sort of the right number of sig figs, let's think about this. Turns out it's a little tricky here, because here we have this to the second digit. Here we have this. When I calculated this FF, we probably have that to the third digit. Normal force we have to the second digit. Really, these sums are only good to 0 0.03 newtons, right? We only have one sig fig left, and why? Oh well. And then here, again, they're all going to be good to the second digit, so I'll say it's 0 0.16 newtons, and why would... The camera has this annoying tendency to just stop recording if the video file gets up to a gigabyte. That's why it got cut off. Anyway, what I was saying, I finished the calculation. I got 0.1 to the right number of sig figs, 0.16 newtons in x, it's in the positive x direction, it's minus 0 0.03 newtons. And in fact, sort of as expected, the net force is down. It's pulling it down the ramp. So it'll slide down the ramp. And the net force is that way. Even though there's a little bit of force that way, the net force is that way, so it's going to accelerate downwards as a result. We'll worry about f equals ma later. All right, so that's the end of this problem.
third problem is done. I've given you two, two expressions for gravity. So one of them is um, Fg is equal to mg times, and here I'm going to do a terrible thing, down hat. Right, that's supposed to be the unit vector pointing down, whichever way that is. Or I could just say Fg is minus mg y hat if x is horizontal and y is vertical. That is for near the surface of the Earth. I have also given you this one, Fg equals g m1 m2 over r squared for the magnitude of gravity. And so that's what happens in space when you have two objects of mass m1 and m2, a distance r apart then that's the magnitude of the gravitational force of one object on the other. This question says, derive little g, the gravitational acceleration of an object near the surface of the Earth, given the Earth's mass, and I'm going to write these numbers up here, the Earth's mass, that little an O with a plus in it is the standard symbol for the Earth, is 5.973 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. That the Earth's radius r plus is equal to 6378 kilograms. Well, that's not 6378 kilograms, 6378 kilometers, which is the same as 6.378 times 10 to the 3 kilometers. And remembering there are 10 to the 3 or 1,000 meters in a kilometer, that's 6.378 times 10 to the 6 meters. And I did that conversion because we're going to want to have this in meters eventually. And finally, Newton's gravitational constant, big G, is 6.674 times 10 to the minus 11th meters cubed per kilogram seconds squared. Okay, derive little g. How do we do that? Well, here's the thing. If physics is right, if this is all one thing, I should be able to use either one of these expressions to calculate the magnitude of gravity on me for example, or anything else near the surface of the Earth. So let's do that. Basically what you've got is the Earth here, and here's the center of the Earth, and then you've got a person on the Earth who has mass m, and here's the mass of the Earth, this m plus. And then the force of gravity on this person, I should be able to use either one of these expressions. So I should be able to say that the force of gravity on this person, the magnitude of that force, is either gravity times the mass of the Earth times the mass of the person divided by, now what's the distance? Well, the distance is the radius of the Earth plus um, your center of mass is probably, I'm going to assume that it's about halfway up. That's probably not right, it's probably a little lower than halfway up, but it depends on your exact proportions. Whatever, approximately halfway up, so it's radius of the Earth plus h over 2, where h is the height of the person. Now. Typical height of a person, let's take a very tall person, is 2 meters, all right? And the reason I say that is because h over 2 is 1 meter, and 1 meter, when you add 1 meter, well, that's also equal to 0 0.000001 times 10 to the 6 meters. So if I add this to this, it makes no difference whatsoever. So, aha, this is why... It turns out you could talk about the gravity of this here and the gravity here being the same is because the difference in, from the distance to the center of mass of the Earth, the center of the Earth, from the eraser here, can you see it here? Here it is. From the eraser here to the eraser here, that difference, which is just a meter, is tiny compared to the radius of the Earth. You would need to have seven significant figures before you would even notice it. Okay? And so that's why we end up just putting the radius of the Earth. It'll be good enough. So I'm going to put in the radius of the Earth here, that should also be equal to m times little g. And now we have everything we need. Because what I'm after is solving for little g. Well, okay, divide both sides by little m and I'm done. Little g is equal to g times the mass of the Earth divided by the radius of the Earth squared. Interesting. Let's put the numbers in, see if it works. So it's 6.674 times 10 to the minus 11th meters cubed per kilogram second squared, scary, times the mass of the Earth. I can already tell that I'm going to have board management problems. So now that I've written G down, I'm going to erase G so I have space. The mass of the Earth, I copy from up here, 5.973 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. 
and I divide by the radius of the Earth squared, which is 6.378 times 10 to the 6 meters squared. Let's think about units. Kilograms cancel kilograms. I have meters squared, meters cubed on the tops. So my meters squared here is going to cancel two of the three. I'll be left just with meters. I'll be left with something in meters per second squared, as expected. And I can put the numbers in my calculator. OK, with the numbers in my calculator, what do I get? Guess what? Two, I have four sig figs here with the numbers I've given you, 9.800. That's what I get, putting these numbers into my calculator. Now, some of you may remember the, nine point, the number 9.81 meters per second squared. And in fact, I have told you in class that it varies by from something like 9. Point, I don't remember exactly, 9.77 to 9.82 meters per second squared, depending on where on Earth you are. And the reason for that is Earth is not perfectly round. It's, I'm going to exaggerate it. But if you look at Earth from the side, the radius to the North Pole and the radius to the equator are a little different. It's a little bit oblate. I vastly exaggerated it here. Small differences like that give you small differences at the half a percent level at most in the strength of gravity. So in this third significant figure is where it changes. So really, that's why I only give you two significant figures for gravity most of the time. But you can see that it fits exactly, little g you get exactly from using the universal gravitation formula. So there's not really two different gravities. This is a simpler model of gravity that works very well close to the surface of the Earth. Now this also tells us how you figure out how close is close to the surface of the Earth. Well, close enough that when you go up, it doesn't change how far you are from the center of the Earth by very much. And given that I had this to the kilometer, if you go a kilometer up, well, that's not going to change it to two sig figs. That's in the fourth sig fig. That'll change it in one of these two sig figs. So, OK. And you can go a kilometer up. You can usually go a couple of kilometers up if you climb a mountain. Um, but it's still going to be nine points. This is still going to be good to two, maybe even three sig figs. But if you go up hundreds of kilometers, OK, then it's going to start to make a difference. You can't just use mg anymore. But for all our purposes near the surface of the Earth, this is just the simplified version of this. G ends up being constant everywhere instead of having to always put in little different R's because it doesn't matter. Compared to the radius of the Earth, moving from here to here just doesn't matter. All right, that's it for forces. Um, next, we will start doing F equals MA.